Um, I talk about it all the time, but usually when I talk about this topic, I'm talking to a very specific group. For example, policymakers or advocates who know a whole lot about the topic, or students, or sleep researchers. And I very rarely talk to such a diverse group. The problem is that um, I'm a science communicator, as you heard, and, and to talk to a diverse group forces you to con basically violate one of the cardinal rules of science communication or really any communication, and that is that you're supposed to tailor your talk to your audience, which is very hard to do when your audience is coming from so many different places. Um, but then it actually occurred to me that this is the perfect group for what I have to say. And um, I'm hoping by the end of the hour you're going to understand why I'm saying that. But for now, let me just say that it's, it's exciting for me to see educators and health people and policy makers and advocates and students and researchers all together in the same room, literally and figuratively. And that truly is the heart of what I'm going to be talking about today. And what I'm talking about today specifically, of course, is sleep deprivation in teenagers. And we're going to be covering these three learning objectives, talking about the extent and the impact of sleep deprivation in teenagers. Um, we're going to be looking at the individual and structural roots of that problem. And actually, Julie, this is showing the wrong slide right now because I've changed the PowerPoint. Okay. So um, I don't know if we can sure. fix that. Yep. But this is the PowerPoint I'm looking at, but that's not what is showing oh, up. Oh, I wonder if we maybe have two files open. Yeah, I think so we have two files open, so let's make sure it's showing the right one. But anyway, I will be discussing these things. And then we're looking at the impact of changing school start times on sleep deprivation in teens as well as their health and performance. And finally, I want the one that is says that UT correct? Austin. That's the correct okay. one. Yeah, this is the right one. And finally, we're going to be exploring some of the aspects, the political and the psychological and the cultural aspects of making a change so that school hours are compatible with the sleep needs and patterns of teenagers. This is definitely the right one. All set? Does that look good? Um, Yeah, I guess so. Um, let's see if it goes to the next one. Yes. So sleep, sleep. Sleep seems to be everywhere you look. At least it's everywhere I look. It might just be me, but I don't think so. As a matter of fact, while I was lined up to get on the plane in Baltimore yesterday, the people behind me were talking about sleep. Because what they were doing was looking at a display on the newsstand next to us that had consumer reports and its cover story was called The Secrets of a Great Night's Sleep. And that just made me laugh because actually, um, many, many years ago, back in the 80s, I wrote a story for Consumer Reports but with basically the same title. Um, th those were the years when sleep labs were just coming into being. And um, of course, it was not a cover story. So it was great to see this as a cover story. But it just seems to be in the wind. Um, of course, we're not just talking about sleep here. We're talking about teen sleep. But even here, unless you've been asleep for the past decade, you've undoubtedly seen some of these sorts of headlines that we have a real problem with adolescent sleep. There's apparently an epidemic of sleep deprivation in teenagers. Um, and this kind of story in the national media has been there at least for, for over 10 years, probably since the National Sleep Foundation released the results of a poll they did, which revealed that about 87% of U.S. high school students were not getting enough sleep on school nights. That, that really hit the newsstands in 2006, and since then we've seen many other studies and reports confirming these findings. You don't always hear the exact same statistic about the extent of sleep deprivation, and that's because researchers define sleep deprivation in slightly different ways, or they measure it in different ways. But however you slice or dice it, it looks like we have a real problem with teen sleep. Um, I should go back a slide. One of the reports that, that keeps coming out from the um, looking at the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which is a national survey that is done every four years amongst high school students, and it's, I think it's conducted by the CDC, right? Um, they have found that over two-thirds of high school students are reporting getting less than eight hours of sleep on school nights. And this is consistently found every time they do this poll every four years. Um, and when you look at the data even more closely, you see something that I find even more disturbing, and that is that nearly 40% of teenagers say they're getting six or fewer hours on a regular basis on school nights. 
And this certainly is not the only finding. In fact, a few years ago, a couple years ago, there were headlines saying that basically all U.S. teenagers are sleep deprived. This came out of a, a study by Charles Bosch at Columbia um, University Teachers College, also looking at the youth risk behavior survey data, but this time defining sleep needs as at least nine hours of sleep. So if you you know, make the, the barrier basically, if you basically define it as nine hours, you're gonna find more teens are sleep deprived. Um, you can see on these pie charts how it breaks down. Those blue slivers in the pie charts, that's the percentage of teenagers who are getting at least nine to 10 hours of sleep a night. Basically 8% of girls, 9% of boys. And that red slice to the right is the percentage of teenagers getting five or fewer hours of sleep a night. It's over one in five teenage girls. They also found something up that's even more disturbing perhaps, and that is that the older teens were in high school, the, the fewer of them got enough sleep. So these are percentages of teenagers in various grades who get sufficient sleep, defined as nine hours a night. By 12th grade, it's maybe 5%. And then we heard about a great sleep recession. It turns out that it's not just that teenagers are not getting enough sleep now, but there's been a steady decline in the percentage of teenagers who are getting enough sleep since the early 1990s. I have to say that this study was co-authored by my host, Julie Maslowski. That's not why I put it in my talk. I always include it in my talk. But it really was a highly publicized and very disturbing study that looked at trends over a, you know, the past 20 years or so. And we have seen a number of very disturbing things including the fact that the proportion of teens in all age groups, and this just wasn't just high school, but ages 12 to 18, the proportion of those teens regularly getting at least seven, they were just asking for seven hours of sleep, that percentage decreased from 1991 to 2012. And I forgot to mention that this is based on monitoring the future study, which is another huge, huge study of um, a data pool, almost 300,000 teenagers, I think. Um, and over these years, the proportion of all age groups getting enough sleep continually declined. And again, they found that the older teenagers got, the fewer of them were getting enough sleep. Something was going on throughout high school that was making it harder and harder to get enough sleep. Um, the largest decline, which I find very interesting and don't really understand, was during the 1990s. Not recently. There's a continual decline, but the largest drop-off was in the 1990s. And in the most recent years that they did the survey, only 20% of 18-year-olds were getting even seven hours of sleep a night. There were some other concerning trends that came out of this study that are worth thinking about. One was that girls were less likely than boys to get seven hours of sleep. Minority students and urban students and students from lower socioeconomic groups got relatively less sleep than their peers. And paradoxically, these same students, the ones who were getting relatively less sleep, were more likely to say that they did get enough sleep. Now this is a different kind of data that I just find endlessly fascinating. This is not data from surveying students about how much they sleep. This is data from a company that distributes sleep apps to teenagers all over the world, sleep cycle. They measure not when teens say they're going to sleep, but when the app says they actually do fall asleep and when they wake up. And just looking at this chart gives you a little clue as to what is going on with teenagers. These are average times that teenagers fall asleep around the world on school nights. Look at the distribution of times. The very earliest average fall asleep time is amongst Swiss students. It's 11.37 p.m. Look at South Korea at the end, 1.20 a.m. These are average times. I mean, obviously some students are falling asleep earlier and some later. But um, in the U.S., we're, we're kind of on the early side at almost midnight. Our teenagers are, are night owls, clearly. Um, whatever we'd like them to do, they're going to sleep very late and they're also not getting very much sleep according to this data either. Um, the, in South Korea, you probably could predict they're getting the least sleep. They're getting five hours and 46 minutes on average on school nights according to this sleep cycle data. Um, the longest sleep time was not eight hours in any group. American teenagers on average get a little over seven hours of sleep a night. 
So clearly there's a sleep problem in teenagers, however you look at it. Um, and it, it wouldn't matter if sleep didn't matter, but of course we all know that sleep does matter. At least we know that theoretically. We're told by the public health experts that sleep is just as important as diet and exercise. And um, there's a good reason for that. We, most of us, at least theoretically, spend about a third of our lives asleep. And we're learning more and more about the critical role that sleep plays in health and in safety, um, in functioning and basic overall well-being. And that's true for everybody, not just teenagers, of course. But it's a particular concern to find these sleep problems in adolescents, um, just as it would be, say, in babies and children, because there are different sleep needs and patterns at different stages of life. And of course, all children and adolescents, these, these are human beings who are still growing and developing. So when they have sleep problems, there are unique concerns that we have to think about. Um, one of, we know that we change our sleep patterns over a lifetime and our needs. We all know that babies sleep a lot, right? Babies sleep 14 to 17 hours out of every 24. And elementary school children generally need about 11 hours of sleep a night to thrive. Um, by the time they reach adolescence, they need, a, on average, about nine. And of course, there is individual variation. But the typical teenager needs about nine hours to do well. And clearly, this isn't happening from the data I just showed you. You can pick any study you want, but it is not happening. And it turns out we shouldn't only be worrying about the quantity of sleep teens are getting, we should be worrying about other aspects of their sleep. Because one of the really interesting things that's coming out of sleep research in the past few decades is that when it turns out, it turns out that sleep's effects are measured not just by how much sleep you get, but the quality of your sleep. Anyone with sleep apnea knows what I'm talking about as well as the timing of that sleep and the consistency of that sleep. What I'm talking about is that timing is when you sleep in the course of a 24-hour period. Human beings are really hardwired to sleep at night. And when we don't sleep at the times our bodies are telling us to sleep, we don't get the benefits of sleep. And in fact, our health is jeopardized. And there are many studies showing this. What's even worse than not sleeping at the time you're hardwired to sleep is to sleep at inconsistent times. And that's why we keep seeing these studies of shift workers who have all sorts of increased rates of, of serious health problems like diabetes and heart disease. Um, our teenagers are not sleeping at consistent times either, as we will see. So when I'm going to be talking about why this is a problem, you have to think about these four variables as being affected. And school start times obviously play a role not just in the quantity of sleep, but in the timing of sleep. So just keep that in the back of your mind. I don't have time to go into all the horrible things that happen to you if you don't get healthy sleep. But this chart is really, it's called the effects of chronic deficient sleep. And the reason I use the term deficient, which I got from Judy Owens, a, a leading pediatric sleep researcher and pediatrician, is that deficient captures the idea that it's not just how much sleep you get, but when you sleep that affects your health and your learning and your mood and your behavior and your thinking and even how well you do on various measures of school performance like attendance and tardiness and graduation, grades and test scores. And um, there, is a, there really is a growing body of evidence that links poor sleep, whether it's quantity, quality or timing, to many of the, um, to all of the measures on this chart. Um, so we are seeing these effects. These are, this, this chart is really targeted at what happens to teenagers who get poor sleep. And as you can see, we're talking about some very serious issues. Um, the inability to stay attentive and alert or process information or recall information or solve problems in class. Rising rates of tardiness, truancy, um, problems with dropout rates and test scores and grades. The mood and behavior problems are huge. Sleep really does control our ability to manage our moods. Um, when teenagers don't get quality sleep, they're more impulsive. They can't tolerate frustration. There are, there's much more um, signs of depression, suicidal ideation even. Um, aggression fights, health risk behaviors increase. And the health and safety concerns are vast as well. In teenagers in particular, we think about putting these sleepy teens behind the wheel. And there's a lot of evidence that car crash rates go up in teens who don't get healthy sleep. Um, athletic injuries are more common. The healing of the athletic injuries is slower. Um, 
there's more, I don't even have this on the chart, but they, they tend to get more colds and infections because the immune system is affected by sleep. And there's even some evidence that by depriving teens of sleep on a long-term basis during adolescence, we put them at risk of some very serious long-term health problems, including diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and multiple sclerosis. So we're talking about a, a serious issue here. We don't want teens to, to be sleep deficient, obviously, and the question is then, well, why? Why are we seeing these trends? Why are teens so sleep deficient? Why are they getting less sleep, apparently, than they did earlier in the century? And here, there have been many culprits put forward as explanations. And it's clearly a multifactorial problem. As much as I believe in later start times as a solution, we all know that they are not the be all and end all of te teen sleep deprivation. There are many roots of the problem. And um, some of them, just to name some of the leading ones, include uh, the 24 7 society we now live in, where we can be up shopping or you know, web surfing or watching TV or texting or doing anything, really pretty much any time we want because we have these lights that allow us to do that. Um, another culprit that's put forward a lot are um, not only the changes in work and business hours, but just the general devaluation of sleep. I'm so sorry. That's okay. We have some breaking news, but this something will still be on. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, I thought this was the most important problem in the entire universe, but I guess not. Um, it is important, though. Uh, we, our culture really doesn't value sleep, though, so we don't think it's that important. We think sleep is a sign of weakness. We think it's a sign of lack of dedication and motivation, and teenagers pick up on that. So that's a possible explanation. And then there are personal reasons that these teenagers might not be getting sleep. They might have poor sleep hygiene, not know how to get good sleep. They may be up with their phones texting. They may be um, in a room that's too cold or too noisy. Um, they might have a sleep disorder. That's, those things have been put forward as well. Um, changes in, at puberty and the way sleep is controlled, which we'll be discussing at length later, certainly play a role. And everybody, of course, talks about social media and screens and phones as playing a role. And other people have said, these kids are up later than they ever were doing homework. They're pressured to take AP courses. They have to be at sports practice until 10 in the evening. Um, they have jobs after school. And of course, then they have to wake up extremely early for school. So these are some of the leading causes that have been thrown out there to explain what we're seeing. And think about it for a minute. Some of these are clearly not unique to teenagers, right? Some of them aren't unique to our current society. S many of them are interrelated, and some of them aren't changeable. But some of them are unique to teenagers, and I think they're worth looking at more closely to see if they might explain what we're seeing. One of them is one that I, I have to tell you that I don't have enough fingers and toes to count the number of people per month who tell me that the, the real problem, of course, it, is the phones, right? Everybody says, well, the reason we're seeing this decline is that the kids are up on their electronics all the time. On top of that, they're exposed to light that we know keeps makes it difficult to sleep and truly is correlated with problem sleeping. There is some truth to this. There are studies that show that teens who use electronic devices before bed or, or frequently during the day have trouble sleeping. They have trouble falling asleep and they don't get as much sleep as other teens. That is true. On the other hand, though, there really are no studies to date showing that if you take phones away or you take these things away that sleep deprivation is reduced in teens. There was just a study that came out this week where they tried to take phones away from athletes. It had no impact at all, at all, on their sleep. Um, there's even less evidence about the stuff about homework and APs and sports. All of us, if you're a parent, you have anecdotal evidence about your child up there doing homework. There's no question we have anecdotal evidence about it, but we don't really have any studies showing that decreasing um, the time of a sports practice or homework load is going to help the sleep problem. It might, but we don't have that evidence to date. Where we do have really strong evidence is biology. What we know from sleep studies in the past 30, 40 years is that at puberty there are changes in the way sleep and wake are controlled that make it very, very difficult for teenagers to fall asleep as e early in the evening as they did when they were young children or that they will when they're older adults. 
And I'm not going to go into the technical details, but basically there are two systems that control sleep and they both change at puberty. One is the, the ability to resist the pressure to fall asleep. That's called the homeostatic sleep drive. And it just becomes easier not to fall asleep when you feel sleepy as you turn into a teenager. The other thing that happens is that your circadian rhythms, that's your internal body clocks that controls so many physiological processes, including the release of hormones. These clocks shift two to three hours later at puberty so that you naturally feel sleepy two to three hours later and wake up two to three hours later than you did when you were younger. Now you may say they're, they're falling asleep later because they're up on the phones, and a lot of people do, but there are actually studies in other mammals, including primates, and rodents that show that they also release melatonin, which is the hormone associated with sleepiness. They release melatonin considerably later when they go through puberty. And I assure you that these animals are not up texting. So <laughs> <laughs> this really is a phenomenon. The other thing that happens is that, of course, they wake up naturally later. And we're, we've learned now that the REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, where the bulk of learning and memory consolidation take place, that is concentrated in the last third of the night. So for teenagers, that's going to be in the early dawn, early morning hours from about 5 to 8 a.m. That's when this very critical REM sleep is occurring. And keep that in mind as we talk about school hours. And by the way, this, is, this shift at puberty occurs in everybody. It's not just in people who are natural night owls. Even if you, we talk sometimes about chronotypes, people who naturally are morning people or larks or evening people who are owls. And there have been studies looking at the change over the lifetime. The graph on the bottom are larks over the course of a lifetime and the owls. And you can see that larks get up earlier than owls no matter how old they are. But at puberty, everybody gets up later than they did before if they can. Um, you've probably seen this if you know children. You don't need studies to tell you that little kids have different sleep patterns, right? Little kids usually go to bed early and wake up early. Um, and parents usually know what's going on. They can control when their children fall asleep. They can put their child to bed and usually, not newborns, I know, but, but older elementary school kids can be put to bed at 8 or 8.30 and they usually fall asleep and parents know it. Teenagers are a completely different story. You can, you can put a teenager to bed, but you cannot make a teenager sleep. And often parents don't know what is going on once they close a bedroom door. I often say, I don't certainly want to open the door of my 16-year-old son to see if he's asleep at 2 in the morning. We just don't know what's going on. Um, and many teenagers say they, even if they do try to go to sleep, they lie in bed for hours. They just can't fall asleep till 11 or 12. So this is, of course, where the school start times come into the picture. Because the average US high school, as you can see from this graph, this is data from the US Department of Education. The average US high school starts at about 8 in the morning, but that's the average. There are many, many high schools that start in the 7 a.m. hour. I know a couple that start at 6.50 for regular class. And about 10% start before 7.30 a.m. Only and 43% before 8 a.m. And remember, when I tell you the times that class is starting, that's not even considering what time the buses are picking these kids up or the kids are getting out on the road behind the wheel. The county where I live has the first pickup at 5.23 a.m. And the children are asked to be there 10 minutes before that. And then you can think back about waking up, eating breakfast, showering, walking to the bus stop, and you start to realize that teenagers in this country, many of them, are waking up at 4.35, 6 in the morning, to get to class. They have no choice in the matter. They're actually being woken in the middle of this critical period of REM sleep so they can go to school. And this is why, of course, Recently, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Medical Association and the Centers for Disease Control have all recommended that middle and high schools begin classes no earlier than 8.30 a.m. It's really not a radical proposition, but it's clearly not happening, as you can see on this map. This map is a map of the, by state of the percentage of public middle, high school, and, and combined middle and high schools that start before 8.30 a.m. And the ones in dark blue, which is most of them, are the ones where 75 to 100 percent of those schools start before 8.30 a.m. So basically this is a pervasive problem. Over four in five U.S. middle and high schools start before 8.30 a.m. right now. 
and they start at times that are incompatible with adolescent sleep needs and patterns. And they basically mean that if a teenager is going to get quality sleep, and not even quality sleep, but just enough sleep, and, and rise at 5 or 6 a.m., they, they can't, even if they go to bed at a decent time. Forget about the biology I told you about. If you could get a teenager to go to sleep early, look at the times they'd have to be asleep to get nine hours of sleep and wake up at these times. You take a typical 15 or 16 year old, the middle line, who has to wake up at 5.45 or 6 in the morning, that teenager would not only have to be in bed but sound asleep at 8.45 or 9 at night. Now some teenagers do and can do this, but most can't. We know that we have school activities running later than these hours. And that, this is really a problem, so we basically see that whether you want to talk about physiological reasons or cultural reasons, it's unrealistic to expect teenagers to get enough sleep when we're waking them up at these times. Here's another way to think about the problems, just in graphic form. That big red arrow on the left is showing you the physiologic delay in circadian clocks that happens as teens go from their old childhood bedtime to their teenage bedtime. And the gray square in the middle is how much sleep time they get. And that would be one thing if they could sleep later in the morning. But what's happening is that they're getting pushed from the other end of the chart as their school hours tend to get earlier and earlier. Now, ironically, I know that here in Austin, the high schools start later than the elementary schools. But that's actually the exception. In most US communities, it's the high schools that start earlier than the, than the elementary schools. So basically, that rectangle in the middle, that a sleep rectangle gets narrower and narrower. And so you see what the problem here is. It's not just that teenagers are not getting healthy sleep. It's that with current school hours, they can't get healthy sleep. And they can't really make up for it by napping either or by sleeping in on weekends or by drinking caffeine or using energy drinks. They certainly do all of these things. Um, the, the early high school start times mean early release times and a lot of teenagers who aren't doing anything else will come home and if you're lucky they'll take a nap. They can do other things as well like those risky health behaviors but many of them will nap all afternoon um, and then they can't fall asleep till very late at night so it becomes this vicious circle. Naps also can't make up for that loss of that REM sleep in the early morning hours. And that oversleeping on the weekends, it can make teens feel better, but what it really does is it sets them up so that they're in a state of permanent social jet lag, which is exactly like jet lag you get when you fly from coast to coast, but you don't have to go anywhere for it. All you need to do is sleep at very different hours on the weekend, and physiologically you're in the same state. It's like flying from coast to coast and back every single week. And this is what most, many, many teenagers are doing. And then, of course, caffeine and other stimulants, they can perk you up temporarily, but they don't make up for sleep's benefits. Sleep researchers always say that the only substitute for sleep is sleep, and it is true. So we really do have to get, we have to address the problem. And to do that, we have to look at the roots we are talking about and see how many of them we can change. Here it is very useful, I think, to divide the causes of the problem into individual roots and, and structural roots. And what I mean by that is individual roots are things you can fix by fixing an individual person. You can help teens sleep if, for example, they have poor sleep hygiene. You can help them fall asleep under more ideal conditions or you can address an underlying sleep disorder. But you also have to look at the structural roots of the problem, which are larger than the individual, things in society that you have to address to fix a problem. And that would be things like institutional practices, homework, extracurricular demands, and of course, these very early hours, but also environmental problems, like the fact that we light up our houses very late at night and that keeps us awake, or even social norms, like our attitudes that celebrate sleep deprivation. And both individual and structural roots are really important. They all need to be addressed. But I think what's important to think about here is that if you address individual roots of a problem like sleep deprivation, you can only get so far unless you also address those underlying structural roots. So that explains a little bit about why I'm focusing on school hours, except there are other structural roots besides school hours. So why am I looking at school hours in particular? And here the explanation is actually fairly straightforward. Of all the factors that I mentioned, only one has been shown with empirical evidence to play a major role and a remediable role 
in teen sleep deprivation. In other words, of all these factors we've talked about, there's actually good empirical evidence that when you move bell times later, more teens get more sleep. Again, when you move school hours later, more teens get more sleep. We're not speculating on this, we know this. And that's of course why all these organizations have issued these statements because the evidence is strong enough for the AMA and the AAP and the CDC to say this is a way we can actually help a large proportion of the population. But we're not doing it as you've seen so why not and in order to understand that we have to go and take a little whirlwind tour of the history of bell times in the United States. How did we get here and why can't we change? And I, I think that by doing this, you're going to see that this is not only a systemic problem, but one that we've created for ourselves and relatively recently at that. So just look at that picture for a minute because I'm going to get back to it. That's a Start School Later sticker on the Department of Education bell, by the way. It's our little civil disobedience. We removed it afterwards. <laughs> I have to tell you that this history I'm about to give you is still very much a work in progress. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for this. It's very hard to get data about bell times that school systems have had throughout history. One of the reasons is that, is that we have a highly decentralized school system in this country. And um, we have actually nearly 13,500 school systems with almost 100,000 schools within them. And they all kind of do things their own way, not just their hours, but everything. So you can't really go to a centralized clearinghouse for most things and see how one individual school has changed its practices over the years. Um, but the other reason that it's hard to get the data is that even if we did have this kind of information, it's highly unlikely we'd find very much about bell times. And the reason for this is that we don't measure what we don't think matters. And until recently, nobody really thought that it mattered what time school started or ended, or really what time or anything started or ended. We measured how long students were in class. We measured how long workers worked. But nobody understood this whole business about the timing of sleep and that it mattered what time things began or ended. So the data just isn't there. The, the data just aren't there. But um, fortunately, historians have other ways of getting information, more indirect ways. Um, diaries and letters and town records, sometimes even popular songs or literature will give us clues. And from that information, We've been able to piece together a pretty clear story about what has happened, and um, so I'm going to share that with you. One of the things that pops out right away is that however it is we do things now, we have not done very long. Um, in fact, just think back to that one-room schoolhouse I showed you, and you'll realize what I'm talking about. I mean, it really wasn't that long ago when we would put 5 to 19-year-olds all together in one room with one teacher all day long, and these students, by the way, all started the school day at exactly the same time, right? That time, as it looks, from what we can tell, was about 9 in the morning until the middle of the 20th century. Um, yes, kids woke up earlier sometimes to slop the pigs or milk the cows or whatever it was they did, but they weren't required to be in a classroom until about 9 in the morning. One of the ways I, we know these things are from town records. This is a report from New Haven, Connecticut in 1878. And it's, it's a directive to teachers about what time to be in the classroom. And from this, you can piece together the fact that the schools ran this way. Students were in class from 9 to noon. Then they got a nice two-hour lunch break. And then they came back from 2 to 5 for an afternoon session. Now, some schools around the world still work this way, but I assure you that no teenager in the United States has a school schedule like this at all. Things really have changed tremendously in a relatively short period of time. Another way they've changed is the fact that teenagers even go to school. I mean, think about it. Free compulsory education is a really relatively new phenomenon, particularly for high school students, but it boggles my mind when I realize that it was only in 1917, literally a hundred years ago, when every U.S. state started requiring even all elementary school students to be in, in school. Most teenagers just didn't go to school. In the early 20th century, maybe 6 to 11 percent went to high school, much less graduated. And by the early 1970s, over 90 percent of high school students were in school. So you see there was a huge change in the way we did things in a relatively short period of time. 
So if you want to talk about the way we've always done things in terms of bell times, you really only have to go back as far as about the early 1970s, and in fact, 1970, to see anything remotely like what we do today. So let's do that. 1970, in many ways, was a watershed year in both school start times and in, um, well, in school reform and in, in sleep research. And unfortunately, not for the same reasons. The two had nothing to do with each other. In sleep, in sleep research, 1970 was a watershed year because that was the year when William DeMent, who was known as the father of sleep medicine, opened the very first sleep research center at Stanford. For schools, however, 1970 was a time when many of the trends that had been building throughout the century reached a point when people realized they just weren't sustainable. And to simplify these trends, they were these four things. There were more students, there were fewer schools, they were consolidated, there was more busing, and there were longer commutes. These were all very expensive trends. And unfortunately, the 70s was a terrible time to have expensive trends because there were a, a large number of economic problems that hit in the early 70s, starting with a stock market crash, and then a recession, inflation, a couple of energy crises, mounting fuel costs, and tremendous pressure on the schools to save money on bus costs. So what did they do? They came up with a brilliant solution. Instead of sending all these kids to school at the same time, they would stagger the start times. And they would take their fleet of buses and shrink it down and recycle the same fleet several times over. And um, that would save some money. And at the same time, these schools were being pressured to add time onto the school day. And they usually did it by tacking on a few minutes every year onto the beginning of the day. They did it incrementally. Communities adjusted. And everything was great. Except, of course, it wasn't great because ironically during these very same years sleep research was coming of age and during the 70s and 80s Mary Karskadden and her group at Brown University were beginning to see that teen sleep needs and patterns were different than everybody else's. They were documenting that circadian shift that I talked about earlier, and they were finding ways to actually measure the impact of, of sleep problems in teenagers. And at the same time, other researchers were documenting the critical role sleep was playing in learning and memory. Um, and by the early 1990s, this research was so clear and so strong that sleep researchers started speaking out and saying that these early school hours that had been implemented in the past decade or so were incompatible with teen sleep and health and learning. But of course, by then, the damage had been done. Now, to give credit where credit is due, the medical community jumped on this pretty early on. As early as 1993, the Minnesota Medical Association issued a statement saying that these early hours that had been implemented in the past decade were detrimental, and they needed to move back. But that was 25 years ago, and you saw the graph I just showed you. So they didn't have too much of an impact. So just to review this history, everyone hasn't always started school so early. People think that, but they really haven't. The shift to these early hours occurred before we knew very much about teen sleep needs and patterns. And the moves to the earlier hours primarily reflected budgetary considerations. They did not reflect the sleep needs of children or their health, learning, well-being, or even the convenience of adults. They were about money. Well, we've learned a lot in those 25 years. We haven't moved the start times all that much, but we have learned some very important things. Um, one of the things we've learned is that when you move bell times later, many of the things that we were worried about with sleep deprivation are improved and there are other benefits we didn't expect. But the biggest benefit and the most pertinent one to this conversation is that when school starts later, more teens get more sleep. And obviously I think this, but you know, it's actually contrary to what many people would expect because you might think if you move bell times later, these kids are just going to sleep later. It seems very, very logical. But that actually isn't what happens. You know, there's speculation on one hand and there's empirical evidence on the other. And the empirical evidence is that the schools that have moved bell times find that teens generally go to bed at around the same time and their cumulative amount of sleep on school nights is significantly greater. The first time we saw this was in 2001 when Kyla Wallstrom at the University of Minnesota looked at two school systems in Minnesota, and it's not coincidental that they were in Minnesota. One was Minneapolis and the other was Edina, which is a suburb outside of Minneapolis. They moved their bell times back to the more traditional hours, and they found these wonderful effects. School performance 
dropout rate, attendance, academic performance improved, there were fewer tardies, there were less signs of depression, less sleeping in class, and very interestingly, homework was completed much more efficiently. So that's kind of interesting in terms of those interrelated causes I was talking about, because one reason teens may have so much homework is that they're sleeping through it. Well, since that study came out, the, the findings have been confirmed and extended by many other studies, culminating in another very large study, again by Kyla Wallstrom and her team, that came out in 2014. And this one involves, I think it was six schools, no, six states, schools in six states, multi-state study, and it showed the same things we had seen earlier, plus, very interestingly, um, a reduction in signs of um, Fewer mood swings, signs of depression, but, but new findings involve the use of illegal <coughs> substances, as well as less use of caffeine and energy drinks in teens whose schools had shifted later. And very importantly, they also found a reduced rate of car crashes in teens whose schools started later in the morning. This study came out this week, and it's not a study of schools that have moved their bell times, but a very simple core plot of the t average amount of time that teenagers in Canada got compared to the time their school started in the morning. Now, as you'll notice in Canada, schools, no school starts before 8 a.m. So if we're going to look at this graph and think what it means for us in the U.S., you'd have to extrapolate that left line down lower. But there's a very, very clear linear correlation between the time. This is also a huge study, by the way. It's out of McGill. Um, showing that the earlier school starts, the less teen. Oh, I'm already five minutes away. I've really got to pick up the pace here. Anyway, only one in three Canadian teens is deprived of sleep, so figure out what you will. Recently, um, there have been other findings from these studies. One is that if you move school bell times later, students from disadvantaged backgrounds actually benefit twice as much. I don't have time to go into the details now, but that's, well, that was a surprise, and it's really important. This is a study by um, economists at Brookings that documented that. They also found that change is cost effective. Schools can change their bell times at low or no cost, but even if they have to add buses, it turns out that the benefit to cost ratio calculated by these economists was at least nine to one. So it doesn't need to be pricey. So we know this is a fixable problem, and the question is why aren't we fixing it? So for this last five minutes or whatever I have, I'm going to talk about why we're not fixing it. And here I like to quote Schopenhauer, the philosopher, who said that all truth passes through three stages. First, it's ridiculed, then it's violently opposed, and third, it's accepted as being self-evident. This is very, very applicable to this issue because it really isn't about the science or the truth. It's about the politics of the problem. Um, actually, this is almost always the problem when public health is tried to be turned, when you try to turn public health into policy because people don't change their behavior or their policies based on science, reason, and evidence, or at least not only on the basis of science, reason, and evidence. They, they change based on things like their emotions and their values, social norms, their pocketbooks. And um, the classic example, of course, is cigarettes, where we knew for years that lung cancer and cigarettes were linked, but there was no change in policy for decades. And so the way this plays out in the, in the start time world is that when people first hear about the issue, they do often respond with ridicule. And the ridicule is based on long-seated beliefs about sleep and, to some extent, teenagers. Teenagers are lazy. Just put them to bed earlier. Or just throw cold water on, on them in the morning. We have a lot of these myths and misconceptions on our website. And that usually is a reaction by people who are just hearing about the issue for the first time. When communities actually are faced with a change, however, we move to the second stage, which is venomous opposition. And th this opposition is usually based on fears that are quite legitimate fears. After all, community life in many ways revolves around school schedules, right? And when you propose changing a school schedule, people start worrying how it's going to affect their commute and their daycare arrangement and the after-school sports practice. They worry about how they're going to pay for it. Um, now, it turns out that most of these fears are unfounded. We found that in school systems that have moved their bell times, and they're all resolvable, but they're incredibly powerful politically, and I can't emphasize that enough. Um, Deb Delisle, who's a former superintendent and ha was at the U.S. Department of Education until recently, said that probably the most difficult thing you can do as a superintendent is try to fool around with the bell schedule. People go absolutely bananas over that. 
And while we're talking about produce, um, <laughs> Kyla Wallstrom has called this a political hot potato. And she's absolutely right. And this is because, again, communities adapt to the hours they have. They push back when you suggest a change, sometimes to the point where superintendents have lost their jobs. They don't want to touch the issue because they know there's going to be pushback. Now, my fellow advocates hate when I say this because they think I'm going to scare everyone away. But I will end on an upbeat note because this situation is changing. But this is why we still start school so early. As Upton Sinclair said, it's hard to get a man to understand evidence when his job depends on his not understanding it. So you can take all the science you want and bring it to your school board, but it's not going to be heard. So, and yet we know many schools have changed. It's not all hopeless. From those schools in Minnesota to the schools in 70 districts that were recently studied by Judith Owens and her team, we know it can be done. We list many on our website. And in fact, there's been so many that Judith Owens and her team, who were then at Children's National, they issued a blueprint for change where they culled out many lessons about what you need to do for successful change. They, their basic findings were that there's no one size fits all, but there are certain shared components of communities that do this. One of them is a leadership that believes in this cause, that reaches out to educate stakeholders about why the change is happening and about sleep that builds consensus among stakeholders and, and authentically listens to these fears and concerns to address them. But the biggest lesson of all that jumps out of this report, and please read it if you're thinking of changing your school system, is that where there's a will, there's a way. Again and again, they found that in school communities that prioritized health and learning, there are creative, affordable ways, many creative, affordable ways to run schools at safe and healthy hours. So how do we build political will? And I will try to close in the next minute or two with this. See, this, is, this is good. Yeah. I'll give you yeah. Minute okay. Yeah. Political will is obviously a very challenging thing to change, but what we're finding is that the, the solution to this problem is a reframing of the issue. We need to treat sleep and school hours as public health items, not as negotiable school budget items. And those of you who are in public health are probably thinking, well, it is a public health issue, obviously, but it really isn't in many school systems. For, for many school leaders, sleep and school hours are negotiable budget items that have to be weighed against other negotiable budget items, like whether to pay teachers or buy textbooks. And they, they have trouble making this change. But the minute that these are framed as absolutely non-negotiable pub, public health needs, everything flips. And suddenly what seemed difficult, even impossible, becomes, to paraphrase Schopenhauer, inevitable. So basically I'm saying that we have a call to action to create a climate that allows for healthy school hours by reframing this issue and building political will. And obviously that's going to take more than stockpiling studies. It's going to take really coming out of our comfort zones and interacting with all the different stakeholders on every different level, local, state, and national, to build this political will through a variety of steps. And really, this is how all public health reform happens. It's not just school start times, but it is a public health issue, and it has to be treated that way. We have to do grassroots advocacy and education from the ground up, and we have to change policy from the top down through position statements, legislation, and maybe even litigation. And the good news is this is starting to happen. People are working together from different fields to get legislation passed. We've had three bills passed already in the past three years. Two have been studies. One is an incentive program to recognize school systems that move their start times to healthy hours. This just, just passed in Maryland last April. That's a later school start time team in the back with the governor <laughs> signing the bill. We are seeing all kinds of outreach, education, and advocacy efforts where sleep researchers are coming out of the woodwork and working with advocates. Educators are working with policymakers, and they're going beyond their usual boundaries of what they're supposed to do in their disciplines to advocate and educate. Some of these are students, in fact, who are talking on media shows or working with social workers or educating um, school leaders at conferences. We're even having a national conference at the end of April where we're bringing all these stakeholders together. Together. And finally, and I think this is the most promising, I think the, all these statements by not just the American Medical Association, but also local and state 
PTAs and teachers unions and youth sports groups all saying that school start time need to move later. These are real signs of progress. Um, they are really going to turn this situation around by making it impossible really to even consider running schools at these hours. They're really changing the way we think about sleep and school start times. So that I do think finally we're in a position where we're going to look back and we're going to wonder how on earth we could ever have done this. We're really, it, it, we, I think Schopenhauer is right. It, we're getting to the point where because of these sorts of changing in social norms through the education and the advocacy and the statements and the legislation, we really will think that running schools in safe and healthy hours is nothing short of inevitable. So I am going to close. Thank you very, very much. If you want more information, you can check out our website these other two websites as well, schoolstarttime.org, startschoollater.net is our website. There's lots of excellent references. And I hope I have at least a few minutes for questions. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. We have time for questions. And if we don't get to your question, Tara will have a few minutes afterwards to take individual questions. While you're thinking of your questions, I wanted to that we have local Texas Start School Later chapter leaders here. If you want to uh, raise your hand. So these guys are working on the issue locally in Texas. So feel free to talk with them afterwards if you're thinking about local. Um, any questions? I have one, but I'll. OK. Hi. Um, I'm as oh, I don't think this works. <laughs> It's, it's just for the camera. Oh, OK. Um, hi, I'm a student here in our Health Behavior Health Education program, um, a graduate student. Thank you so much for your talk. It was very exciting. I also have family that works in school districts in um, Los Angeles, so I'm excited to talk to you more at lunch. Um, so my question that I kept thinking about um, as you were talking is um, also those hours of 3 to 6 p.m. where we see so much adolescent risk behavior happening with, um, you're talking about substance use, risky sexual behavior, delinquency, and it seems like this uh, later school start time could also potentially impact that. And I think of all the community organizations that really focus on those 3 to 6 p.m. hours, and I wonder if y'all have collaborated with those folks. Okay. We're starting to talk to them, and there's definitely a lot of talk about about the flip side of this whole thing, a lot of our group says things like, you know, teens don't get pregnant at six in the morning, right? <laughs> but we're leaving this very, very large window of time open after school. And that also has changed historically. Schools didn't always get out at 1.55 or 2.05 p.m. But there's not a lot of really good data, as Julie will tell you, because she's looking at it. But um, there's not a lot of good data showing for sure that ch those changes make a difference. But it seems really logical. So we are looking into that. It's, it seems highly likely that those problems are related to the early v release times, right? Yeah, definitely. Hi, I'm James Pustyovsky. Um, uh, so at, at, towards the end of your talk, you, you seem to be arguing that like uh, the effort now is towards, or should be towards advocacy, education, outreach. Uh, I'm just wondering if you, s do you see any sort of critical research needs still out there? There are, there are many, many research needs. I mean, there's an interplay between advocacy and research, right? The advocates need good research, or their whole advocacy effort doesn't have any credibility. The problem that I've seen, and it's a problem that goes well beyond this field, is that researchers are often trained not to advocate. And in fact, that if they advocate, it casts doubt on the lack of bias, right? Their objectivity in their research. And that's been a real problem for social movements because if you really believe your research at a certain point, how much responsibility do you have to go out there and see that people understand it? And there's an interplay between those things. There, there's a lot of things we don't know. I mean, a lot of the things I mentioned are correlations rather than absolute proof. And there are many theories, just the, the idea that you propose that have not been confirmed. We have a lot to learn, but we can't wait to make decisions till we know everything. If we did that, we'd never do anything. We have to make decisions in the face of uncertainty because these are real people, real children who are living this life, and we already know we're doing damage. So I do emphasize the advocacy and the policy change now, but absolutely, there's a lot of research to be done. I just like to see the researchers working hand in hand with the advocates and um, educating them and speaking outside their own communities. We've had too much preaching to the choir, and you can see the impact it's had because there hasn't been much change. I'm 
Hi, my name is Shanting. I'm actually from China. So when you show those data that when Chinese students are, are going to sleep, it was really surprising because I actually um, started schooling. I like yeah, I was in a boarding school, so we had a certain time for the lights to turn out, and um, so we slept around 10 p.m. And also, um, in our schedule, we have the time for uh, like a noon lap, noon nap. So students can get a power nap during the, uh, at noon after lunch. So I think it's really beneficial for me, at least, that I feel really energized for my afternoon courses. So do you think that power nap will be more will be also a strategy that stu uh, schools can use to resolve the sleeping? Yeah. Depression. I mean, there are ways that you can help the situation and a nap in the middle of the day. There's lots of creative ways to run a school schedule. But if you were going to sleep at 10 o'clock, I mean, that's only an hour earlier than most teens can fall asleep. And so a nap could probably compensate for that to some degree. One of the things that we have to remember is that humans can do many things. It doesn't mean that they should do those things. It doesn't mean they're ideal. It might have been better if you got to sleep in a little later in the morning. but. You certainly what you experience isn't anywhere near as extreme as what most teenagers are experiencing and I'm not sure they could make up for staying up till 1 and 2 a.m. and waking up at 5 with a nap. Mm -hmm. But with a, a schedule which is enforced in a boarding school, I think you could. And some of the studies that I mentioned, by the way, were done in boarding schools where the students did have their sleep regulated. But they even found that moving that bell time a little later was still helpful. But absolutely, naps have their place and they can help. Just not totally. Yeah. All right. I think we should wrap up. Uh, Tara can take individual questions if you'd like. Let's thank her again. Great. Thank you.